So thank you everyone for joining. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Melissa Sassy, and I, uh, I wear a lot of hats for anyone who has ever um, met me. They know I, uh, I play in a lot of spaces and you know, you'll, you'll hear about some of the, the things that I play in, in a, in a second, but again, um, thank you for joining uh, for any of you who, um, you know, are on Twitter. I have um, added my Twitter handle into uh, the chat window, feel free to take pictures, feel free to live tweets, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always interested in, um, you know, hearing from uh, IEEE, um, you know, HKN uh, members, uh, fans and advocates or anyone who, um, you know, might be interested or exploring, um, you know, either uh, educational journeys or careers in, um, in tech. Um, I've had a very interesting um, ride uh, in tech so far. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about that first. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen, and it should be sharing shortly. So looks like it's sharing. Um, I think Nancy or Sylvie, let me know if uh, you know if you don't see it on your side. Um, but it should be should be good. Looks All good. All right. So it is okay. Super. Um, so as I mentioned to Sylvie, bonus points for putting dogs into my presentation today. All right, so again, you can find me on Twitter at Mentor Africa with, uh, with a K. And I'm very, very excited to be here, partly because yesterday I didn't have much of a voice. And I thought, oh no, am I going to let all of you down and not be able to give my talk? But um, it seems to be doing okay. So hopefully um, it, uh, it fares well. And, um, you know, thank you for, um, you know, thank you for being here. All right, super. Let's. Let's jump in. I'll tell you a little bit about me for um, any of you who have never um, heard me speak before or for any of you um, I have have never met. Um, I have this motto. I have a few of them, actually, but one of them I, I kind of stole from an amazing engineer who is also a fashionista. She's a, a, a startup CEO and just an amazing overall woman. And uh, her name is Donna Sakar. Um, she works at Microsoft. She is the um, chief technology officer of the accessibility team at Microsoft. And she always has this saying, and I, I stole it. I love it. I'm going to keep on stealing all the amazing things that, that she says because she's um, an amazing human. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, an amazing engineer. And she says this thing, and it's um, be an and, not an or. And for me, um, what that means is, you know, don't let anybody put you into a predefined sandbox of who you are, what you are. and you know, what you're, what you're all about. Um, you know, I balance being um, both an entrepreneur, meaning I'm innovating and creating inside of somebody else's company. Um, IBM, for example, I'm an ex-Microsofty. I worked on Wall Street, um, you know, spent a lot of time uh, working on digital skills and readiness. Um, it's uh, actually the um, research topic for um, my, uh, that, helped me uh, become a doctor, that um, helped me get my PhD. I uh, spent a lot of time um, really thinking about what it means to be digitally skilled and ready. Um, you know, so a lot of that I bring into, you know, my my role in big tech, you know, again, working in somebody else's company. I'm an innovator. I'm a creator. You'll see more about that in a second. Um, but I'm also an entrepreneur. You know, you probably saw, you know, some of the, you know, different company names in my, you know, in, on my first slide, on my second slide. Um, you know, I uh, have my own nonprofit called Mentor Nations, and we've taught tens of thousands of young people to code in uh, in 12 countries. Um, we have a co-working space, a robotics lab, an IoT lab in Tunis, Tunisia. So North Africa, sandwiched in between Algeria and Libya, um, funded by the U.S. Department of State. Um, we've also gotten funding from HP, Google, SAP, and, you know, won a number of, um, of or uh, were nominated for a number of different um, U.N. awards. Um, so very, you know, active in not just, you know, what can I do in my local community, but, you know, what can I do, you know, around uh, the world? Obviously, digital skills advocate, but I'm also very passionate about um, youth empowerment. And I believe that um, the youth are our future and you should have a seat at the table in anything and everything that we do. I, uh, for example, have a 17 year old mentor. And, um, you know, she always chuckles when I say that, because I think when she approached me to be her mentor, I think she didn't really realize that she was signing up to be my mentor as well. Um, I'm also a writer and speaker. Obviously, I'm speaking now. And, you know, if you've ever heard me speak before, um, you know, I do this a lot. I really enjoy it. 
I enjoy writing about or speaking about um, a number of different topics, which is um, youth empowerment, empowering the underserved and underrepresented communities that, you know, live and breathe within, um, you know, society and, and helping to bring others, you know, up. I use my platform in tech um, and my position of power to not just be the only person on the stage, even though I'm the only person on the stage today, I'm very active at, you know, bringing people, um, you know, up versus saying, this is my position of power and I'm going to keep it. You know, I think it's very important for us to look around and, you know, see the more, you know, junior people who we work with and, you know, enable them to have opportunities, whether that's learning, speaking, growing, you know, whatever it is. Um, I am an academic too, you know, obviously I got my, my PhD, so I spent a lot of time writing, um, much to my detriment sometimes, because it certainly, um, you know, took me away from a lot of uh, fun things, but, you know, thankfully last year I finished up my research, uh, defended my, my research and, you know, can now put some fancy letters either before or after my name. Um, IEEE in general, as well as HKN is very um, important to me. I think um, the broader IEEE network helped me to propel my career into what it is today. Um, so I'm a big fan of uh, volunteerism. You know, I wanted to change my career. I was doing something uh, very different um, before I started working in the education sector, the startup sector, um, you know, youth empowerment, empowering women and girls, that sort of thing. I uh, worked in the global advertising team at Microsoft, and I was part of the um, the team that inspired um, Microsoft's mission of empowering every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Um, so a lot of times in my prior life, I was looking at people doing inspiring things, um, looking at people changing the world. And I was behind the, let's say, operational aspects of enabling those stories to be told. But I wasn't out changing the world. I didn't really know what my passion was. I didn't really know what I was born to do, so to speak. And I think uh, volunteering initially for the IEEE in its, um, you know, uh, internet inclusion um, initiative that it had a few years ago, um, I discovered a passion for uh, digital skills and readiness or digital intelligence. And I realized that that was what I was born to do. That coupled with um, you know, kind of making, let's say, meaningful use of the internet. So uh, enabling people who have no digital skills to get skilled, um, enabling those who already have skills, you know, engineering students, um, uh, you know, a, various capac a variety of capacities, as well as professionals to say, what skills do I have and how can I share those skills forward? Um, you know, so I, I would say that volunteerism plays a very important role in my life and should play an important role in your life. No matter who you are, what you are, you have superpowers and you have things to share with others. And you should do that. You should do that often. And that can happen in your community, in your family, with your friends. Um, you know, I mentioned that I have a few different, you know, mottos, if you will, that I like to use. And the next one is uh, making the impossible possible. And um, for me, this came from... Um, the president, uh, who's now the president of Ogilvy, um, one of the largest advertising agencies in the world, when he was at McCann, uh, another large advertising agency. And I was thinking about starting up my own nonprofit. I was um, doing digital skill building along, around the world. There, my dog said hello. I told you bonus points for dogs. Hopefully she's not going to be too noisy and, and bark today. She's usually pretty good. Um, but you know, I have this thing where I, you know, was presenting what I wanted to do. And he said, you've overcome a lot of adversity in your life, Melissa. Um, and you know, you keep going and I see your motto as making the impossible possible because some of the things that you've overcome in your life, um, have been so challenging and difficult and traumatic, you know, you keep going and, you know, people would never, ever guess that you've got this crazy pain inside of you. Um, you know, for anyone who's heard me speak, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, um, I would say give me a Google and you can probably find out what that is. Um, and there are a bunch of articles out there about how I turned my um, uh, my worst nightmare into my superpower. All right. So I used to be a perfectionist. I used to think that, um, you know, I always had to achieve the best thing. You know, and we all know that we're not always going to achieve perfection. Most of the time, you know, that's not going to happen. And, you know, a lot of times I felt really, you know, let down when I didn't achieve the greatest. And I realized that I was always setting myself up for, you know, for failure, because if we always set ourselves up for those 
often unattainable goal, we're not always going to get there. And it's going to, you know, bring us down and make us think like we're not good enough or we don't, you know, deserve a seat at the table. We're not smart enough. Everybody else around us is smarter than, than we are. Um, because I'm not an engineer, fun fact, I could I can't code my I, I couldn't code my way out of a cardboard box. Um, I've always had this um, fear working in tech around, um, you know, wow, I'm not technical. Do I belong in tech? Um, and that's something that, you know, still like plays a role in my life. But um, I've learned to create what I call a Thrive Hive. And that is um, a group of people who are infectiously positive about um, about me, about my um, my development. And I'm equally passionate about them and, you know, their development, their journey, their future. Um, and there's always a time for constructive feedback and, and, and uh, what have you. But um, I think we often need that group of people around us who are our cheerleaders and helping us to remember that we are not imposters. Um, we don't need to be perfect. And we do deserve that seat at the table, whether we're an engineer or not, whether we're a business leader or not. You know, it's possible to combine a lot of these um, things together. But you didn't come here to hear about me. You came here to think about, you know, digital intelligence. And, you know, I, I mentioned in the kind of write up of this session um, that, you know, we, we hear about IQ, you know, how intelligent are you? You know, whether, you know, you believe in those metrics and whether the score of this means you're intelligent or not, we'll put that aside. You've heard of EQ, which is emotional intelligence. So how do you regulate and manage your own emotions recognize those and others have good relationships, not only with yourself and what's happening in your head, but with others. One of the things that you don't often hear about, which you should hear more about, and this is something that I work on evangelizing every single day, and that's DQ. And that is digital intelligence or, you know, what some people call digital literacy. What you'll find is I believe digital literacy is a component of digital intelligence. You'll find what those competencies are. Uh, or you'll see those in a second. Um, I don't know about you, but whether you are a student, an early career professional, or you've been in your job for a very long time, it doesn't matter where you are in your journey. Um, you know, there are a lot of jobs in the future that haven't been imagined yet, haven't been created yet. Um, we've got rapid technological you know, innovation happening. We heard in the last session uh, or on the main stage about um, you know, the next big thing. And I think regardless of, you know, whether you're talking about, you know, sensors or quantum computing or cloud computing or AI or machine learning or whatever, doesn't matter. Um, you know, a lot of, um, uh, you know, trend, you know, a lot of innovation and disruption is happening in every single industry. You know, whether you're talking about financial services or healthcare or, you know, education, technology is infiltrating every single sector that's out there and it's disrupting it and it's making, you know, those of us who are, you know, on our learning journey, by the way, you should always be on a learning journey. Um, that's one of the necessary building blocks of learning, um, you know, to be prepared for the future of work and ensuring that you are future ready. But I, you know, I, I know I'm worried. I, tr I constantly try to, you know, get myself up to speed on what should I be learning? What should I know? And trying to incorporate that into everything that I do. And for me, um, being prepared for the future of work, um, it has three components. We're not going to review all three components today, but I'll tell you those three components now. Um, you know, one of them is, um, you know, uh, thinking about, again, that lens on, you know, how do you make yourself, um, you know, future ready? But we've got essentially three things that, um, in my mind, I call this Dr. Sassy's trifecta of skills. And this is, you um, you know, kind of uh, very related, not only to my role at IBM, um, you know, also related to um, my my nonprofit, but also I have my own startup where I took a platform that we were using to skill um, young people in Tunisia and have turned it into a, a new startup. You're not going to find it anywhere online because we haven't launched yet. Uh, our, our, you know, I have the URLs, but we haven't launched the website yet. Um, we're done with our MVP or kind of our minimum viable product. And within my startup, we focus on, you know, three different areas of skill building, digital skills and readiness, which we're going to learn about today. We're going to double click there. Habitudes are what I call habits and attitudes. This is a fancy way of saying soft skills or professional development skills. And then the third component of that trifecta is entrepreneurial thinking or entrepreneurial spirit. Now, I don't care whether you want to be a CEO, you want to be the founder of your own company or startup, uh, or you already are. 
you know, or, you know, you're like me, you balance entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. You know, for those of you who um, are really only planning to go and work for somebody else, you don't want to have your own company, or maybe you don't think you're going to have your own company one day, you still need to think like an entrepreneur. So again, we're going to double click on um, this digital skills and readiness component today. And this is really where digital intelligence comes into play. Where did this whole model come about? Well, I'm the chair of IEEE's Digital Skills and Readiness Working Group. Um, we spent um, you know, a few years uh, researching all of the different frameworks and competency models um, for what, it get, what exists when it comes to being digitally skilled and ready or digitally intelligent. OK, and it was the first, um, you know, uh, first uh, standard for digital skills and readiness that was, um, um, you know, kind of recognized worldwide. Um, and I, I you know I'm really excited that I got to chair something like that. It was endorsed by the IEEE Standards Board and the, the digital skills and readiness framework that we um, leverage. It originally came from the DQ Institute, uh, which is a nonprofit based out of Singapore and uh, you shown. Uh, Park, who is doing um, some amazing work within that nonprofit. I collaborate with her often. Actually, we just got together a couple of weeks ago um, and we're due to have a catch up again. Um, she works on a lot of policy reform, also a lot of tracking of what um, it means to be digitally skilled and ready. And then in my area, I focus on how do I take that framework? How do I take that theoretical model and empower the world with practical skills, whether you are learning them for the first time or whether you're using this model to share your skills forward with others, everyone needs to know what it means to be digitally skilled and ready. Right now, if I went out and I asked a thousand different people, even experts who spend their entire careers, have spent their entire careers focused on tech or technology skill building, you know, they may they will give you a thousand different answers of what it means to be digitally skilled and ready. And we all know, and if you don't, you should, that if you can't define something, you can't measure it. You can't determine whether you're succeeding or failing. So when we all talk about driving digital inclusion as part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or when we talk about you know, um, making the world a more you know, digitally equitable place or driving digital equity, or when we talk about you know, digital inclusion, how do we know if we're succeeding or failing if we all define it differently? We don't. This is the problem. And this is the problem that I'm on a mission to, uh, to solve. All right, so now that we're double clicking into um, digital skills and readiness, let's talk about what um, the high level competencies are. After we do that, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna dive into each of them. So it, is eight competencies and think about it as a wheel. You know, you've got one of these on this wheel and think about it as you're dialing those skills up and down, depending upon whether you're at the basic level, a consumer of technology, so you're consuming tech, you know, you're, you know, um, reading, you know, your, you know, Facebook updates, you're, um, you know, searching the internet for information. You are a consumer. You're not, you know, a creator, you're not a maker, you're not a doer, you're consuming technology, you're consuming content, or you're consuming, you know, the materials or learnings or whatever that um, are included in that platform, that app. All right. Now let's dial that up a bit and think about, you know, as you learn to be more digitally skilled and ready, you turn into a creator, a maker, someone who is creating content creating a mobile application, an IoT device, um, a website, a uh, you know e-commerce solution, whatever it is, you're creating technology for other people to consume. See the difference? Consumer, and then here's where you're a creator, a maker, doer. Maybe you're a developer, you know, maybe you're you know electrical engineer, you know, paired up with someone who's um, kind of helping you to, you know, bring that into an app or a website or whatever. Could be data and analytics, lots of different things that fall into there in terms of creation. And then the final, you know, kind of um, let's say level, because again, we're increasing our skills, basic or consumer, in the middle, which is a creator or maker doing creating stuff for other people to consume. And at the high end, you're a consumer, 
you're a creator, maker, and doer, but you're also using those skills of being a good consumer, being a great you know, uh, maker and doer or producer, entrepreneur, or creating something for someone else. And the final is you're teaching others, you're educating others, you're a thought leader, you're an influencer, you're an educator, you're taking those skills and you're empowering other people in your family, your best friends, your community, an entire you know, classroom, the country, the region, the world. OK, so again, see this as a wheel of competencies. You got eight of them and each of them you're dialing up and down, depending upon your interests, your skill level, what you want to do in your life. Um, so we've got identity. And again, we'll talk about this, what the, each of these mean. Use, safety, security, emotional intelligence, communication, literacy and rights. And don't worry if you're looking at this and thinking, well, wait a second, where's like coding and computer science? Where's you know, AI and machine learning, you'll see how that comes into play in just a second. And again, bonus points for dogs. All right, cool. So first one, and I haven't put every single, you know, kind of definition in here of, you know, what digital identity or the others mean. It's just kind of like some high level, high level concepts. If you were to dive deep into each of these, um, either through the uh, uh, startup that I'm creating or I have created, which is um, an ed tech platform that's all about um, solving the skills gap and empowering um, the world to be future ready. You're going to see it soon. We're going through a number of different proof of concept projects right now. Um, I landed my first paying customer a few weeks ago, and um, we uh, we look forward to landing additional proof of concept projects so that we can look and check and see how does the content work, how does the platform work. And I would anticipate in uh, in January um, we'll be ready to. Um, you know, to launch a, a version of it to the to the public. Um, we're likely going to, you know, be focusing on, you know, large, um, large engagements and, um, uh, you know, government, you know, collaborations, as well as um, skilling, reskilling and upskilling um, employees of large um, enterprises. That said, um, there will be an individual component that you'll be able to access um, through our web app. All right, cool. So let's stop talking about that. I could go on and on about my startup and everything else that, um, you know, pumps me up about some of the endeavors that I have. But digital identity, you know, your online persona and your reputation matters. I, um, I pay close attention to um, my personal brand. What is it? Who, do I, who am I? And how do I use um, social media, my own web page? that sort of thing um, to really craft my own narrative around who I am and what I am so that when other people search for me, when they stumble upon or purposely find some of my materials, they know what I'm about, what I stand for. Um, they know something about my skills and my experience, what I'm passionate about. But I personally craft how others see me and talk about me when I'm not in the room. Because I know, and if you don't know, you should, now that your online persona impacts the real life people are going to look for you what are they going to find you should pay attention to what that is have a strategy and have tactics to um, support your online identity if you're just consuming you know social media whether that's instagram snapchat whatever and you're not creating content that supports who you are as a person you're still a consumer of technology you haven't moved you know up in those skills um, so think about, do you, you know, again, do you have that web page? Are you are you curating and creating content in LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, wherever your audience is? You know, do you know what you're all about? Do you know what your passions are? And are you using um, the Internet to share those passions, that knowledge, that experience with others? Again, if you're not, get started. My boss in my current job, when I was hired from Microsoft to IBM, she knew that she wanted to hire me before she met me. I'm going to repeat that. She knew she wanted to hire me before she met me. So imagine before you go to an interview, your boss knowing that she, he, they, whatever, you're the person. How can you do that? Your online person. Okay. Your network. Very important. Um, again, there's this direct connection between your online and offline world. They blended together. They're no longer separate. That whole thing of I'm going to meet you in real life. Well, you know, yeah, maybe I, I haven't met you, you know, kind of hand to hand in real life, but um, I don't know about what you think, but the online world is just as real as the offline world and the offline world 
uh, influence your online world and vice versa. Um, so pay attention to this stuff. Who are you? What you are all about? What is your identity? All right, next, your use. This is all about healthy factors. How are you? you how are you maintaining your personal health? Um, you know, if you're excessively gambling, um, excessively gaming, or using um, the internet, or you know, addicted to social media, you know, it makes you less productive. It impacts your personal health, your mental health. It's very important that we have the ability to self-regulate. You know, not rely on someone else to say, "Hey, it's time to stop playing that game. You've got stuff to do." You know, you need to finish. You need to get ready for your exam. You've got a big project tomorrow, or even if you have nothing to do, what are you doing to use? Um, technology and the internet um, to be more productive. That could be, you know, tools, uh, productivity tools, okay, to help you do things better, faster, quicker, more efficiently, more strategically, whatever. But also, again, that health factor, how are you not excessively using things that you shouldn't be using? And what impact that has on you, your future, um, your view of yourself. Um, we've all got to manage our screen time. It's super important. Um, again, whether we're a consumer of technology or any of the above, you know, it's very easy to get you know, stuck in, um, uh, you know, something we love. I personally love tech. Um, I manage my screen time terribly. I talk about it often, um, but everyone around me knows that I wear a lot of hats. I say yes to far too many things and it, it brings me to, you know, kind of, um, uh, managing uh, my online world and my collaboration with others um, pretty much every every waking hour. Um, so I, I, I don't claim to be an expert here. I know what we should be doing, but it's it's hard for me to. Um, third is uh, digital safety. And, you know, uh, online world is a scary place. Um, you know, how are we preventing or responding to, you know, cyberbullying? Um, you know, we've all, um, you know, probably been impacted by, you know, cyberbullying. You know, a troll. Um, we've all been, you know, uh, probably had different different degrees of this. Um, something that is probably one of the uh, most challenging things about, you know, about tech. Um, it's, you know, recognizing and handling harassment and stalking and knowing what you should do. Um, and sometimes there's no right or wrong answer. Sometimes it's really hard. You know, how do you, you know, how do you block someone? How do you report someone? And I've had a lot of really challenging situations. Um, you know, I have, um, I've been a victim of, um, you know, someone sharing uh, sensitive photos of me online. And luckily I got them taken down, um, but things that I didn't know were out there that I found. And, you know, imagine the role of, you know, you as a, a leader and someone seeing some, you know, something with you where you're changing clothes. That happened to me. And I, uh, you know, it happened to be from someone I know. And, you know, I uh, thankfully um, was able to get, you know, that stuff off the Internet because, again, I had the tools and the resources to know what do I do? How do I report? How do I get some of those things removed? Um, and, you know, how do I keep keep on and how do I, you know, still show my face at at work? How do I still show my face um, in places where someone might have seen one of those photos? Scary stuff. And these are the things that. Um, often uh, young women and girls um, are impacted by, in addition to, you know, um, revenge porn and other things. Not to say that, um, you know, I think there are a few different elements where that comes into play, both safety and security. We'll talk about security in a second. Either way, you know, we all need to formulate strategies for coping with um, online behaviors, um, you know, and, and that has a lot to do with what we'll talk about later, and that's um, emotional intelligence. Um, we got to realize how to manage our own emotions and emotions in others, which again, I think what you'll see is these wheel, this wheel of competencies. Um, they also, they often intersect with one another and they're often, you know, inter, interconnected. Um, so we got to manage our footprint. I haven't mentioned that here, but, you know, we have to make sure that we know, you know, where are we going and what can other people see? What are we doing online? And, you know, how, how is our information being used for us or against us? Um, you know, very sensitive topic you know, these days. Um, all right, security. You know, how do we make sure that we're, you know, protecting um, ourselves and others from being hacked? Let's say you're passionate about information security and you go out and get a job in InfoSec, um, or you go out and get a job on, you know, data security compliance, whatever. Um, you know, you've got those skills, you've learned those skills, and then you're gonna go out and you're gonna implement those policies in someone's company or your own. Um, and then again, you know, let's say you've got the skills, you know what to do, and you go out and teach your family, your friends, your classmates, 
um, you know, those, uh, let's say more junior than you, how can they avoid hacking malware, ransomware? Um, how can they recognize, you know, phishing, uh, online scams, use a password manager if you don't? How do you tell people about, you know, the different skills that they need to have when it comes to managing their footprint, protecting their sensitive data? And this also has to do with, you know, um, you know, uh, knowing what you should share, where you should share it, how you should share it. You know, naturally, I might feel more comfortable, um, you know, when it comes to my safety or my security, um, sharing where the heck I am in the world right now, you know, where I'm having lunch. You may not. And trust me, I've had I've had a bad situation before where um, in one instance, and this is probably more related to safety than security, but you know, kind of the same. I had my Facebook page open to the public. So again, that would be an example of am I, you know, am I using the right practices to be safe and secure? And then I, I checked in and I, I was in a, a small village in uh, North Africa and I was running a, um, a camp, a coding camp with a bunch of engineering students and a, a guy who had been following me because again, my Facebook page was open. I kept it open because I share a lot of, um, you know, uh, events where people can learn and grow. And I, I don't look at it as something I should, you know, keep locked down. Um, and I, I checked into this, to this school or it was a library or community center in the small village. And it just so happened that um, a guy in that village um, or in that, you know, that region, you know, in North Africa had been following me on, um, on uh, Facebook and other platforms. And um, he decided he was going to, he wanted to meet me and he'd been wanting to meet me for a long time, I guess. And I guess he had like a number of different um, profiles that he'd set up in, um, you know, throughout, you know, his journey with me in um, the online world. And I blocked a few of them, but I guess I didn't block all of them because I didn't recognize that they were all the same person. And he would created a bunch of different profiles. Um, I blocked some of them. And again, my, my Facebook page was open. And so he showed up at the someone I again, I'd never met. Uh, showed up at the event and um, had a camera and said, hey, I'd love to, like, um, you know, uh, volunteer to be a photographer of the event. And the organizer didn't think anything, you know, bad about it. And he happened to know, he happened to know the guy. And uh, the guy was photographing and um, he showed up just so he could meet me. And he stole some of our things so he could spend more time with us. Um, he started stalking me, um, started calling, you know, through Facebook repeatedly, kept opening up new profiles. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to reach out to me in many, many different platforms. Um, uh, you know, thankfully I was able to, you know, uh, get the name of his mother and his father. And I called his mother and father and told them what he was doing. And, you know, they were very embarrassed or very sad and, you know, had a chat with him. He kept doing it and he ended up going to jail. Um, luckily I was okay. Um, and, but it was a very scary experience for me as a, you know, as a leader, as a speaker, um, someone who wants to invite others to join, um, recognizing that sometimes you're you're going to have your safety and security at risk because of how you um, how you use the, the online world. Um, there were other parts of the world where I did not share where I was. I would share where I was after I was there um, because of those same safety concerns. Um, you may not have those safety concerns. These things may never happen in your life. But again, we have to think about what can we do to protect ourselves both, both in the virtual world and, you know, in the in real life world, if one can say that. Um, as I mentioned, you know, emotional intelligence is one of the most important skills that we're all going to learn, um, whether that's digital emotional intelligence or otherwise, uh, when it comes to being future ready. We've got to have empathy for, for others. We have to, you know, also recognize our feelings. What are we feeling? What are our emotions? Um, and recognize when the emotions are you know, high for someone else. And that's sometimes hard, you know, especially if we, um, you know, come from a different culture, come from a different country, a different socioeconomic class or different background where, or, you know, maybe English is not our first language or we're communicating in a language that is not our native, you know, language or a mother tongue. Uh, we might say things, uh, you know, different than what, you know, someone would, would expect us to say. And we might accidentally say something offensive or we might do it on purpose. You know, so we all have to recognize, you know, again, how do we regulate our emotions? How do we develop skills to respect others, maintain healthy relationships online, but also um, protect ourselves, see, keep ourselves safe and secure, know when to block, know when to, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, report. And again, that's kind of more around the social media frame. But, 
you know, when we're a creator, a maker and doer creating technology, empathy is really important because we have to understand our audience. We have to understand their pain points, their aspirations, their goals and objectives. If we don't, we are not going to increase. We are not going to create inclusive products. Our um, teams need to be reflective of our audience, our customers, our clients, our users. You know, if we don't, we're going to create things that are not appropriate or not usable or not interesting and are never going to come to fruition. So just remember that whether you're consuming technology, you still have to care about others yourself, whether you're creating, ooh, super important. How many of us have used a product that just, you know, doesn't work right? And part of that is, you know, maybe not necessarily, you know, recognizing what the wants and needs of others are. And obviously, if we're going to go out and, you know, teach others or educate others or empower others, you know, we have to understand, you know, where they're coming from. We have to have empathy for others, understand their hot buttons. All right. You're probably wondering, you know, wait a second. She's not talking about coding or computer science yet. Don't worry. We're going to get there. Um, number six, emotion or uh, digital communication. Um, again, managing your footprint, you know, um, knowing what you're sharing when you're sharing creating content that's um strategic and interesting and you know emotionally connects with others contributing positively and with mindfulness teaching others educating others sharing your skills forward with others and again this is you know not just reading what you see but creating meaningful content that enables people to make meaningful use of the internet or influencing others to learn skills, sharing your skills forward. And again, that can be through writing your own blog on Medium. It could be uh, writing your own blog in LinkedIn. It could be having your own website and sharing your own you know, blogs. It could be video. It could be you know, doing things on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. But how are you, you know, creating content that goes out to others to empower others? But this is also about how are you communicating with others? So right now I'm communicating with you. So we're using Hopin. This is an example of a communication tool. Other communication tools that we might use or create are, you know, Slack, Zoom, WebEx. Um, it could also be, you know, um, how are we collaborating with others by sharing and co collaboratively working on a PowerPoint presentation, working in Canva? You know, what are the things that we're using to communicate? Um, how are we, you know, collaborating, communicating with one another by um, collaboratively working on a Trello board or, um, you know, using Airtable or whatever else? What are we using to communicate and collaborate with others? All right, here we are. For those of you who are thinking, wait a second, she has spent a lot of time talking about everything but coding and computer science. Digital literacy is um, where we categorize um, coding, computer science. Um, data and analytics and again part of it is what are you you know consuming you know what are you learning what are you creating and what are you teaching to others um if you know how to code empower someone else if you don't yet know everyone should at least understand the introductory building blocks of coding computer science ai machine learning whatever you want to call it everyone should understand the basic building blocks whether you're going to be um you know, uh, a marketer, a thought leader, an educator, a business leader, whatever it is, I don't care. Even if you're not planning to be an engineer, a software engineer, you've got to understand these things. Um, if you've never done this stuff before, I'm a big fan, or, you know, you're thinking about how do I go out and empower somebody with the skills I have, um, you know, check out Hour of Code, check out Scratch, you know, App Inventor from MIT, you know, what are some of the things that you can use to empower, you know, others to have the skills that you have. But it's also about media literacy. It's understanding misinformation and disinformation. It's about looking at what's being shared, who's sharing it, is it reputable, trustworthy, reliable, should you be sharing it, is it valid, is it real? And a lot of us these days have zero or minimal media literacy skills. Um, I think uh, having, uh, you know, such rampant social media platforms that have infiltrated everywhere. Um, you know, we've all seen, you know, stuff that comes through our, you know, Facebook or whatever, you know, Twitter, we're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe people believe this is real. People do. 
you know, um, and a lot of the, you know, different materials that we see online, they look real, you know, um, when it comes to like deep fakes or whatever, it looks real, you know, boost your skills, share those skills with others. You know, it, it's, you know, uh, it could be um, so detrimental to not have these skills that it could be the downfall of democracy, the downfall of an election, a rigged election. You know, there are, are many, many different, you know, impacts that media misinformation, disinformation play in our lives, not just frustrating us to think, I can't believe my mom believes that, or I can't believe my uncle, my dad. You know, I have this conversation often, and sometimes it goes absolutely nowhere, you know. Um, a lot of, you know, my family members have no media literacy and they look at something and they share it. And they're like, ah, oh, you know, and, you know, sometimes you get really tired of being like, hey, mom, hey, you know, whatever, this is not real. And here's the skills that you need because they get so caught up in, you know, thinking that they're getting their information from a trustworthy and reliable source. So be careful of what you share, you know, recognize whether, um, you know, it's real or not. Um, but it's also about, you know, collecting information synthesizing it, visualizing it, sharing it out, you know, with others. And that might be creating data models. It might be, you know, learning um, Jupyter Notebook. It might be, you know, uh, different ways that you can take in data. It could be Power BI. It could be, you know, Excel, for example. Um, lots of different ways that we can synthesize and visualize information and share it online with others or share it in our communities. Um, right, super important. This is the last one, um, you know, I didn't really talk too much about data protection, privacy, and security. For me, um, in addition to media misinformation and disinformation, um, uh, you know, data protection, privacy, and security is one of the most trying issues of our time. Um, and I don't believe that the majority of companies are protecting our sensitive data. They rely on what's called operational assurance. For those of you who don't know what that means, it's relying on their employees to follow a policy saying, you know what, I got access to your data, but I'm not going to use it for this. OK, so again, it's them promising not to do it. How many times have you made a promise and accidentally screwed up? Or on purpose, it's happened, right? So big risk there. What companies need to be doing, and not all of them are, not many of them are, that's technical assurance, meaning a company may have your data, those employees may work at that company. However, they might be, uh, they, uh, there is an opportunity for us to be deploying technology that prohibits them from doing it. Like it's not physically possible. Um, this is what I work on at IBM. Uh, I run a startup acceler accelerator called uh, IBM Hyper Protect Accelerator, where I enable startups to gain access to enterprise grade technology so that they could protect your sensitive um, uh, data. OK, um, and the product that I, I support is called IBM Cloud Hyper Protect Services. It's super cool. Uh, if you've never heard of it before, um, you're actually um, storing your data on a mainframe, but doing so in the cloud. And for those of you thinking mainframe, what? Um, you know, uh, I am a big fan of, uh, you know, enterprise computing technology or IBM Z. And I, I uh, don't just say that because I work at IBM. Um, it's got some very interesting attributes that uh, make your data more secure. Um, and, you know, it also is something that I think uh, helps companies to do the right thing around um, storing sensitive data on the most secure server in the world. Um, so we should all, regardless of where our data is being stored, and most of the time we have no clue. You're not going to know how your data is being stored, you know, what that company is doing to protect it. You know, if that data is being um, anonymized and sent out somewhere else to potentially be used against you. Or maybe you just are not aware that, you know, you're sharing all this stuff in Facebook, you're sharing all this stuff everywhere else. And that data is being analyzed, modeled and, you know, used to target you to buy stuff or to have a certain view or to change your view. So be aware of what you have. Um, what you what you what is sensitive data who's sharing it what your rights are and you know I think as business leaders as technologists we should be looking at how do we not just um, you know encourage our teams to have operational uh, assurance but it should be technical assurance okay um, and that means recognizing what's personally identifiable information knowing that hey 
I need to protect medical data, financial services data, banking data, insurance data. I need to protect, you know, your data, but I also need to protect myself because sometimes companies don't go above and beyond um, to protect my own sensitive data. But it's also understanding my intellectual property rights. So let's say I go out and I create this amazing thing. You know, I don't want other people to, co to copy my thing. I don't want my intellectual property to be out there. Not only should I be protecting it to the furthest extent possible, but there are ownership rights that I have when it comes to um, the creation of my, my products and solutions. Um, super. So this is um, the competency model. This is um, a bit of a, you know, a deep dive into each of those competencies. Um, again, you can find me at on Twitter at Mentor Africa with a K. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me on, on Instagram. You can find me everywhere. I'm pretty easy to find. Um, so I see Nancy. Awesome. How much time do we have, Nancy? What time do we um, have? We have till about um, 2, 2.05, 2 2.10, but we we have a question. So I wanted to make sure I jumped in. Yeah, sure. So, um, I see um, there's- you're also so awesome. So Xavier has a question about, would you say digital marketing is part of DQ? And if so, yeah. would you recommend learning from a third party that manages your online presence at first, or would you recommend learning as you go? I think digital marketing is part of DQ. And I don't often mention like every single thing that, you know, it encompasses because we'd be here all day long if I went through every single component, but digital marketing, absolutely. Um, if you think about it at, you know, I'll, I'll talk about being a consumer. Our personal brand is a form of digital marketing. Sometimes when we think of digital marketing, we think about, you know, we're marketing um, products, services, solutions, a brand. Now we're a brand. You're a brand. Um, but if you think about it from a company perspective, um, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, creating content, synthesizing content, sharing it out, getting others to act, to react, having a call to action, making sure you're very strategic about how you're bringing them through the funnel of engagement, how you're nurturing them, how you're um, empathizing with them, how you're um, enabling them to become fans and advocates of you, of your product, your service, your solution, whatever. Yes. And then on the, um, you know, should you hire someone else? You know, I think that is um, very, um, I would say personal. And what I mean by that is it's hard to say for me, to without knowing you to say, yeah, you know what? You suck at digital marketing. You're not good at managing your personal brand. You know, get somebody else to do that, you know, um, without, you know, kind of looking and doing an audit of how do you manage yourself and what do you do um, versus, I, and I think there's a couple different things. One that I think is extremely important is authenticity. Um, I can almost always tell when someone else is managing you know, your own profile. When it comes to a company, you know, not as big of a deal, you train people on your brand attributes, you know, you train people what you're all about, your mission, your vision, your goals, your objectives, your style guide, your fonts, your colors, your whatever. You know, I'm not, of course, if you've got budget, do it. The more the merrier. Have some consistency, rock on. Um, however, when it comes to your personal brand, you know, is anyone ever so much in your head that they know how to talk for you and speak for you in a way that comes across as authentically you. How many times have you met someone? Because I know I have met someone and, you know, there's just something about them. You feel like there's a wall between you, you know, where you feel like I, I just I don't know what it is about that person, but I don't feel like they're being um, approachable or um, transparent or open or I, I don't know what they're all about. Like, or maybe you've met someone online and then you meet someone in real life and you're like, wait a second, what happened here? You know, it is very important for us to be our authentic selves, to recognize our own superpowers. We all have them, by the way, our own strengths, what we're all about. And it's very hard for someone else to do that. Now, um, I know a lot of people who are busy and they want to get this big following and they want to have these likes and whatever. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have quality engagement with the real me mm -hmm. in my own personal brand than to farm it out to somebody else. Because imagine, imagine you engage with somebody online. Imagine it's a thought leader, you know, a future boss, let's say. But it wasn't really you engaging with someone else. And then that future boss sees you. 
I love that. Da, 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 da. And they thought, you know, they remember the engagement. They remember the, the communication. They remember the conversation. If you will. Let's say you weren't involved really in that conversation. Someone else was doing that for you on your behalf. You paid that person to have that conversation. You know, you're not going to remember. So you've kind of lost a chance at truly having an emotional connection. You don't necessarily remember what you said. So you don't have the context. Mm -hmm. And how does that other person feel? Even if you play it off really well, sometimes people have a nice spidey sense of recognizing that I don't know what happened with that person, but I don't know. Well, I think, I think your message about being authentic is, is really critical, right? Because again, you know, at the end of the day, we all have to live in our own lives and um, authentic. And I, and I, I I talked to a lot of young people and that online presence, which you're building for your professional life, as well as, you know, all of your life becomes really a critical piece. I think, I think that authenticity is really big. We have another question about, and I love the pun here. Uh, that Chris wrote here. Oh, Long I saw that one. I got a little couple of that one. <laughs> so he gets points for the for the dog reference. How should young professionals hone their ability to recognize misinformation and disinformation? A lot of that going around. No, I love I love the question. Um, you know what I do is a few different things, and I may miss some of the important elements because there's a, you know, I've seen a bunch of really good infographics out there. Um, so apologies if I miss an important point and kind of going off uh, what's in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, so. What I do when I look at uh, an article, you know, the first thing I do is, you know, where's that article coming from? Mm -hmm. You know, meaning who wrote the article? Um, And I think nowadays it's so hard to figure out what's reputable and what's not, because I think um, a lot of, you know, um, our, our views, our individual views, you know, often come into play, you know, when we're writing an article. Even if we don't mean it to, you know, um, we all have biases. Um, Mm -hmm. Some of them are, you know, recognized, known, visible. You know, we know they're there. Others are invisible. Those are the ones that are harmful. Like I remember one time and I still like, I I feel icky when I think about this. Um, I remember one time my, my friend and this years ago, um, and I, I still like, I, I actually a few years ago reached out to her and apologized because it was like something I just didn't see. I thought I didn't grow up very well. You know, I, I came from like a, you know, small town in the middle of Missouri. Um, my mom had three kids by the time she was 16. She made her way out of, you know, um, uh, a very bad home, you know, and did her best to, to give us a home. But, but, you know, she was pregnant by the time she was 13, she didn't graduate from high school you know, worked a gazillion jobs, you know, very, very troubled childhood. And, you know, my dad didn't go to college. Nobody ever talked to me about college. You know, my um, high school counselor wants to make you, and pardon me for saying, but you're never going to be shit. Melissa. Real conversation. And, you know, I, so I, I didn't really have, you know, anybody talking to me about this stuff. And so I never thought like, I was smart. I never thought like I was capable. I never thought all these things. And then later on in life, I realized actually I'm one of the smartest people. Most of my friends know, and I'm not trying to be arrogant. That's just, no, no, no. You, you know, you have that, that emotional intelligence. Uh, Melissa, I know you have gone lots of your talks. We have a lot of your information up on like our YouTube. And And I have a good memory. Like my, I, I wouldn't say that I have a photographic memory in the sense where I can read a book and remember that all the words on the page, I don't have that, but I have just this really strong memory of just, I have all, all just this stuff that comes in and I retain it. And I don't know how, I don't know why it just happens. Um, At any rate, I never thought I'd be anything. And I, I kind of made my way out of it. And so I thought if I can make my way out of it, anyone can make their way out of it because Mm -hmm. all of the bad things that's happened in my life, you know, and my friend uh, was a black woman and is a black woman. And I said to her, like, if you, if, if, uh, you know, other, you know, if I can make it out, you can't teach them unless you don't understand, you know, you already have a leg up from me and other black women. And I'm like, well, I don't think so. And, you know, I, I still feel really, really bad about that conversation because later on, what I realized is that I, I had an unconscious bias. Mm-hmm. I had some kind of thing that I wasn't aware of. I didn't see it. I didn't see the, um, you know, all of these different things happening in society. I was kind of blind to it because I thought, oh, if I can get in this situation when somebody else can, but I, I kind of had a leg up because of a lot of different factors. So anyway, my point in saying this 
is we all have biases. And so mm -hmm. those biases are often going to come in our writing and our materials, mm -hmm. how we're teaching things. So I think first thing is looking at, you know, back to the media misinformation and disinformation question is who's the source? What's the source? How reputable, reliable, trustworthy is that source? And I'll tell you, sometimes it's a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to, you know, kind of use um, kind of media with a grain of salt, recognizing that we have um, some media outlets that are, you know, mm -hmm. far right wing, left wing in the middle, and sometimes they sway back and forth. So when I'm doing a piece on some kind of thought leadership, I don't necessarily go from what I'm going to see in, you know, like CNN or Fox or BBC or whatever. I, I just, you know, I'm going to look back at, you know, what am I getting from, you know, uh, kind of uh, peer reviewed materials. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that I do that's really simple is, you know, if an article has a lot of spelling errors, or if that article mm -hmm. is um, like just some of the sentences don't make sense, um, you know, in your mother tongue. And I know sometimes if if your native language, if you're reading in a, in a language other than your own, you may not mm -hmm. catch those nuances. But I, you know, one of the things I do is look for errors, because mm -hmm. I think if there are errors in that article, you know, and sometimes there are errors in an article that does happen, even when it's peer reviewed, but that's another thing I look at, like if there are errors, mm -hmm. I think, what's that really peer reviewed? Did other people look at that? Mm -hmm. And I look at the history of that particular outlet and mm -hmm. determine, you know, um, you know, and are they, you know, are, are is this really an objective right. source? Um, you know, when I'm using, when I'm collecting stats for a study, mm -hmm. um, I will look at scholarly you know, scholarly things. Right. Well, we're lucky in IEEE, we have access to lots of scholarly technical That's exactly right. Like and I think, you know, stuff, we're, there we go. we're really uh, fortunate within our, you know, within the world we are working with, uh, with HKN and IEEE, we have a lot of great access, access to experts, access to expert information and things like that. But I know there's a lot of disinformation about a lot of world things yeah. out there so but melissa we're getting to the end of our time and i really want to thank you for joining us today you're oh, you're a rock star and yeah. <laughs> and yeah. we love having you with us um you know you can follow melissa on twitter i do um always get lots of great enter at your own risk by the way i am my yes. authentic real self yes. so. i can tell you she's authentic um she's we got more melissa on our youtube channel we've got other things you've done a podcast for us you've got some other sessions so go to our youtube channel for more melissa and um yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thank you for all your thank support you. and for being with us. And hey, if you don't know IBM Z, um, IBM Z for students, there's a lot of great things for students. Go into the portal, I'm going to be able to put it there, Melissa. Um, there's contests, there's competitions, there's ways to be involved. There's I just added a, a link. The in student a, hub. Yeah, the yeah. student hub is something. Oh, I got one with. thing. Let me add this. Oh, sure. I forgot about okay. one thing. Um, IBM, hold on this. Right. Uh, I mean, this I have a great place. Event. Student Hub is wonderful. We we've okay. done a lot of things with you. Okay, great. And your other stuff that you're doing. So perfect. I want to make yeah, sure. I just added a link to a free event that we're holding right. uh -huh. um, on April 5th. Check it out. I, I've got a bunch of cool sessions. Yep. You can learn more hardcore technology yep. stuff. Roll up your sleeves. Information security, quantum computing. Right. All kinds of really cool. Like stuff. I was saying, Melissa, you got great stuff. So I'm glad we had a chance to mention that because I wanted to not let anyone go without mentioning all the other cool resources that are available. So thank you for joining us today. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. I know I, I, I always learn great stuff from Melissa. I love the, your quotes. Um, and uh, I write them down and, and try to internalize them for myself as well. Oh, it's that's awesome. Cool. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care. All right. Well, whatever you're doing, go out and do the thing. Thank you mm -hmm. for having me. And April 5th, we'll see you at IBM Z Day Special Edition. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you very so much. I think there's another session coming up in uh, just a, in a minute on uh, dollars and cents. So what do you do about your money? I mean, money is something people don't talk about. Let's go talk about money. Um, it's really important, especially when you're starting out, uh, maybe even when you're trying to end up. But it's important. So we'll go have that conversation over there. Take care, Melissa. Bye, everyone. Take care.